for the ground rules for today and the coming days. Can I please request everybody to come to the front seats? Um, that way it's easier for those who come in to sit down. On both sides, the ladies and the gents, please. <laughs> I know it's a pain, but part of the rules. Thank you. Um, when exiting after the, the program, please exit one row at a time. Um, please use the hand sanitizers as and when you walk in. Um, avoid gathering while in the center, and Tabarak will be served at the end of the program at the back. Um, after the lecture, we'll have Martam and Ziarath, and for the Q&A, for any questions, please go to shakerf.com forward slash live, and send, send any of your questions there for them to be answered, inshallah. Contactless donations can be given at the back of the hall, or alternatively online at almahdi.edu forward slash donate. Tonight's program is sponsored on behalf of the Marhumeen displayed on the TV screens. Please can we recite a Surah Fatiha for these and all our other Marhumeen Fatiha. Please can we welcome Sheikh with a loud salawat. Qasimi Muhammad Wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin al-ma'asumin al-madlumin Wa ashabihi al-muntajabin Wa man tabi'ahum bi ahsanin ila qiyam yawm al-deen Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Rabbi sharah li sadri wa yassir li amri Wa ahlu luqadatan min lisani yafqahu qawli أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته مع عظم الله وجورنا وجوركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام Continuing with our talk from yesterday The pre-existence of the human soul prior to coming into this worldly existence We find the verses of the Quran very telling They actually gesture at this the verse of Surah A'raf said, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَاكُمْ ثُمَّ صَوَّرْنَاكُمْ ثُمَّ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمْ We created you as in the plural. We fashioned you as in the plural. Then we said to the angels, prostrate before Adam. So our creation and our fashioning, not the material one, but the non-material one, because we were not there with Adam. So there was some form of fashioning and then Adam was made a point of prostration this shows in itself or it hints at the fact that we existed prior to the embodying of Adam and we existed within the folds of Adam and were made a point of prostration for the angels now then the verse another verse further elucidates ya yuhannas ittaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida ثُمَّ جَعَلَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا O human beings, be mindful of your God who has created you from a single soul and then from it he created its pair. So from Adam the pair was created but the soul is one. In another place then Allah says and from them too we spread many men and many women. First is our status of nafs then there comes this understanding of man and women so we are prior to being bodily or being gender confined now if you look at the quran you will find again and again a huge emphasis on reminders and on signs 
Allah says, there is indeed a sign in there for you. What are signs? Signs appeal to us at a variety of levels and we know that. There is a sign in there for you to awaken somehow from within. Now the amazing thing is, Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا And from His signs is that He created for you from yourselves your spouses. How is that a sign? Has anybody asked this question, how can this be a sign? Then Allah says, the day and night are signs for you. How are they signs? And in his, amongst his sign is your sleeping at night. How is the sleep at night a sign? This is something that requires reflection for us to think through. Think about it. Yesterday we spoke about tawaffa. Tawaffa means cessation. Cessation of active participation through the body. Allah says he does tawaffa of the souls when they die and those that have not died in their sleep. Have we ever wondered that in our sleep we actually lose active participation through the body? We are no longer governing our body. We are just suspended. Of course, we see dreams and everything, but this is not active participation through the body. Who is doing this? It is as if the Quran is trying to awaken us to a reality that you are from a place that knows no sleep, that knows no death, that knows no night, that knows no day, that knows no masculinity, that knows no femininity. All of these things have been imposed upon you in your worldly existence. You are supposed to think into this. We need to understand that when Allah says or when the Quran says, there is a sign in this for the mindful ones that they are required to reflect within these verses to awaken themselves and to arrive at a different state of enlightenment to know that actually I am something totally alien to what I am experiencing at present in this world the blessed prophet was asked is there sleep in paradise the prophet said there is no death in paradise and therefore there is no sleep in paradise Think about this. There is no death in paradise and therefore there is no sleep in paradise. Now we can't understand a paradise like that in which we don't sleep. Sleep is the most pleasurable thing, isn't it? But in paradise there is no sleep, the Prophet says, because there is no death. The Quran says they will not die in there save for the first death that they have encountered in their worldly life. And after that there is no notion for of death. Think about it. If that potential is within us, to be in an existence that is deathless, sleepless, what does that say about our essence and what we are? And think about it carefully. The people can change their genders. Does that mean therefore that my identity is through my gender or is it beyond my gender? It shows that my real identity is beyond my gender. Doesn't it? If we can change our genders, then it shows that the identity is before and beyond the gender. Similarly, what falls asleep? The human being falls asleep or the body falls asleep through the fatigue? Who dies? Does the human die or does the body die? The cessation of the functioning of the body as an organized mechanism, as a whole integrated being, when that fails to function in an integrated fashion, we say that is death. Oh, somewhat, that's sort of a definition, Dr. Shahid is looking at me very carefully here. But it's, a, let's say, a, a working definition for us. The body dies, we don't die. We are suspended. Cessation of activity of the soul through the body. The body falls asleep. We are something beyond this. The Quran is constantly trying to awaken us to this. Now, if we take the analysis of the Quran further and try and find out the nature of ourselves, the Quran says, dunya illa mata'ul ghurur. What is the life of this world? Save a short lived pleasure of deception. Isn't that amazing? It's a deceptive, illusionary world. This world is not what we think it is. And neither are we who we think we are. And the odd thing is that we are captured in a prison that is created by us ourselves, as we will explain shortly. Allah in another place says, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ دُنْيَا إِلَّا لَهْوٌ وَلَعَبٌ 
What is the life of this earth save for A. Vain, pass, time, and a sport. What if this world is really, as the Quran expresses it is, that it is a sport? What if we are here momentarily on a particular course that we have chosen to take? And from here, it will determine where we go. Why can't we take this verse seriously that it is a sport? We have come to try out our best and we are going to go onwards. And in order to avail ourselves of this opportunity, we have been embodied. And the body needs sleep night and day and it's all been put into play place. Allah is trying to remind us that you are from a place that does not know night, that does not know sleep, that does not know death, that does not know gender distinctions. Why can't you remember where you're coming from? Why can't you remember your origin? Why can't you remember who you are in essence? Even today, in our astrophysical theories and quantum theories, we say that actually what appears may not be what it is. It can be a very different reality. There may not be any constants anywhere in this world of God. At the level of atomic physics or quantum level, nothing is determined. An electron behaves like a wave. As soon as we see it, we specify it. But if we don't see it, it can be anything. Even the logical axioms fail at this point that something can't be in one place and not be in that place at the same time. For until we fix it, it can be anywhere. Even the logical axioms that we have, we have to now make provisos in there that provided we see it, then it can't be in any other place. But so long as we don't specify it, it's not there. And it is there. It can be there and not be there. This world of ours is not what we see of it. But we are imposing our own upon ourselves a world. We are fine-tuned to create this world for ourselves. It's an amazing thing that's happening. Plato, how beautifully he said that our example is like the people sitting inside a cave. They are facing the wall of the cave the mouth of the cave is behind them. There is a fire behind them. And the fire is casting their own shadows upon the wall of the cave. But they are sitting there not knowing that they are observing the shadows. They feel that these shadows are the truth. It's a reality. They don't understand that the reality is behind them, not in front of them. But they do not have the ability to perceive it accurately. What they need to do, Plato says, of course, he gives the analogy of the cave. He says they need to rub their eyes properly. Turn behind, first cross the level of the fire to see this is a fire that is, a pro that is projecting a false image. Then they have to come slowly to the mouth of the cave. Stand there, rub their eyes in order for their eyes to become accustomed to receiving the radiance of the sun. Then venture out gradually then not look at the sun because they'll be blinded but look at the reflection of the sun within the stream or the river or the lake and finally when they acquire the aptitude within themselves to behold the brilliance of the sun directly how wonderful was this great sage who had explained this to us now i'll give certain examples people who experience a state of psychosis they see things, they hear things, they smell things, they taste things that are not there. Now how can you tell what is reality and what is not reality after that? Now somebody will say, this is a state of mind. I will rebuttal this and say, well, whatever we are experiencing is similarly a state of mind, isn't it? If somebody is color blind, they will not see the color that anybody else sees. If somebody is deaf, they will not hear what anybody else hears. And as a human species, we are fine-tuned. We can't hear what the bats hear. The bats, through the sonar radar that they have, they can see without seeing. They make imageries of walls through the sound that is being reflected that they resonate and it comes back to them. They form a full image. In fact, we cannot fly as fast as a bat and maneuver ourselves and cut corners. The bat without the aid of sight can do all of that. 
If a bee comes into this hall, it will see a very different reality to what me and you are seeing, to what you and I are seeing. Are you, seeing that, are you saying that its state of mind is false and my state of mind is true? Can anybody make such a foolish judgment that the bee's state of mind is faltering and mine is not? I remember when we had that little tremor of an earthquake in Birmingham a few years ago. I was sitting in my sitting room and the cat suddenly meowed and she looked in an odd way. And then she went and hid underneath the sofa. And I said, this is strange behavior. And then 30 seconds after that, I felt the tremor. Whose state of mind is altered? The cat's state of mind or my state of mind? Its ears are attuned to understanding the slightest of waves and repercussions within waves, which mine aren't. In fact, I'm not even living in a proper world. I can't even see the world for it is, can't hear it, can't imagine it. So when a person in psychosis sees a different world to the one that I'm seeing, what gives me the right to make the judgment that what I feel is right, just because fools like me are eight billion who see the same thing as I do? That was a bit harsh, Salwat. Salwat, please. What we call normality is a big deception. There is no such thing as normality. There is no normality in that way. Now you look at the mystics. Ibn Sina describes in his Isharat wa Tambihat, a beautiful treatise, read it. He says, when you are in the course of spiritual wayfaring, you will hear this cry, Allah, in the depth of your heart. And when you hear it, you say, wow, I didn't hear it. And it was more pronounced than any speech that I've heard through my ears. It was more clear. And when mystics see things, it is so vivid that this world appears to be a darkened negative. And then you're baffled. What is it? Was that real? Is this real? What is happening? What is the nature of life? Am I seeing the things for, the, for what they are? Is it all real what this is? Or is it, as the Quran says, it is a delusional existence? It is deceptive. You are not in this world awakened. You are somewhere else. You are within a constitution that is limiting your perception. Even your physical perception is being limited. And then when we dream, sometimes the dreams are so vivid. They are so sharp as if the pixels have been increased million times over. You can see such color, such depth, such detail that is never found in this world. Sometimes the mystics, they hear the name Allah and the heart calls out Allah. They are hearing it and there is no sound and they are hearing it. They are seeing the dead people stand before them. It is not an illusion. They know it. They are not in a state of psychosis and it's not drug induced. You know, you can clearly tell that this is reality and this is reality and I'm not blurring the two. And you're baffled. What is the truth now? What is reality? You see, the Quran has always tried to awaken us, awaken to the truth that is there. The life of this world is not as you have imagined it to be. You are not what you're imagining yourself to be. You are being deluded by your own self. Awaken and make the most of this opportunity that is at hand before it slips away. The Blessed Prophet said, well, it's obviously the Muhaddithin might disagree. And some do agree. But the Orafa often quote these sort of ahadith, people are, in tabahu. people are asleep. When they die, they awaken. They will say what we considered the truth was actually a dream. And what we considered a dream is actually the truth. It's amazing. What is here and what is not here. When they die, they awaken. Look at the beautiful way the Quran depicts it. Today, we have parted the veil from before your eyes. And your sight is as sharp as a blade. Today, you see everything. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Despite seeing there was a veil on your eyes, you were seeing through a veil. You weren't even seeing what was there. If that prelude has gone through, then we come 
to the real issue. That this world and the way we are determined in this world, in gender, in statuses, in bodies, in ethnicities, in religions, all of this carves for us our identity. As soon as we identify with any of it, we have become alienated from the truth and alienated from God. And that is the birth of our ego, I am. And this I am becomes the greatest struggle for reaching the truth. Look at it, our arrogance, our pride, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Koja. Obviously, that's not a point of pride, but I'm just saying somebody might feel that way. I'm a man, I'm a king, I'm a scholar. Tell this scholar, as you age and your memory fades away and you're brought into a, in a wheelchair, you're wheeled into a majlis, then how big of a scholar are you at that point? Look at how popular I am, I'll say, oh fool. This universe of ours, which is a flicker amongst infinite number of possible universes, this universe is 14 billion years old, in which there are galaxies that have got hundreds of billions of stars, and these are smaller galaxies. They have run away in space faster than the speed of light, so the light cannot catch up with it and we will never see them. They have hidden, become hidden in the oblivion of space that will never be known. That galaxy with its hundreds of trillions of stars is unknown and you are saying, I want to be known and I'm popular. How deluded you are. Think about it. Religions, ethnicities, genders, statuses, riches, all of these are false states. They have confined us and they have imposed upon us a sense of false personality. And we are so deluded that we operate within them without emerging out of them. And before we know it, the great messenger of God stands before us and says, come to me. Your time is over. How strange is the life of human being who has been granted a mind through which to ask a question what is it all about and the first thing he does is he suspends that very question doesn't he that question nobody asks why because of our insecurity my religion has given me the answers and I'm I'm comfortable with that but the religion in itself is our interpretation God is trying to say something we are interpreting something else how wonderfully Allah says about the people in the paradise. Waladayna mazid, and we have more to offer. And people will be baffled. They'll say, well, we've arrived in paradise. That's our goal. And the divine says, there is more and much more. Whereas a mediocre person like me will be contented with my paradise, the lover of God will not rest until he meets with the beloved, where there is no paradise, beyond the veils of paradise. When godliness emerges in its fullest glory. Now think about our state. Poverty, riches, sickness, illness. These are the things that occupy us. Life and death. If only we were to know that I am not life, I am not death. I am not sickness, I am not health. I am not wealth, I am not poverty. These are the aspects of the body. The bodily and the worldly. The worldly body falls sick. The worldly body experiences health. The worldly body has life. The worldly body dies. The worldly body has possession. The worldly body loses possession. It's nothing to do with me. It cannot determine who I am. And what I am. If we fall prey to the worldly and the body, then indeed the struggle ensues and we find alienation from God. If we can arrive beyond that state, then at that point, we are on our path to allowing the light to emerge. Now Allah says in the Quran, when they said to the Prophet that good, whatever Allah did was good and whatever you decided, O Muhammad, was bad, at the battle of Ahad, Allah responds in the Quran, say everything was from God. It was all from God. Whatever you consider good and bad was all from God. 
Then a few verses later, the Quran states, Whatever is good is from God. Whatever is evil is from you yourselves. What does that mean? One way of interpreting this is that when sickness befalls me, from God it's an opportunity for me to be purged of a false identity. The veils of darkness of my identity. Allah says he purges his friends from darkness and brings them into light. If I interact with that sickness in a befitting manner and say, O oh Lord, it is your body. It is paying heed to the laws that you have created. Allow me through this sickness to rely upon you and become free of my bodily anguish and pain. Then there is an opportunity for the soul to become enlightened. But if during that sickness I despair to the level that I break and I lose hope, there begins the regressive motion in which I am heavily bodily. I have become identified with this false person. When God gives richness and wealth, if I were to become arrogant with it and claim myself to be something like the Pharaoh I am, then that is alienation from God, distance from God. But if God gives wealth and the heart is still in a state of poverty, that I do not even own myself. By priority, I cannot own anything else. Have you ever thought of this? When people feel pleasure at owning things, tell them that when your body falls sick, why don't you restrain it from, why don't you prevent it from falling sick? You do not even own your own bodies. How can you own anything beyond your body? When your mind loses its memory, you do not even possess your memories. <coughs> How can you possess anything else? In all these things that we are engulfed, God brings an opportunity for us to become good. It is up to us how we interact with these situations. If we interact in a positive way, in a godly way, we become godly. We emerge in God's light. If we interact with them in less than a godly fashion, then we become on the path of becoming more alienated from God. I want to give an example here. The blessed prophet came. He came to monstrous people. He saw in them beautiful creatures. He looks at a man who has buried his daughters. He does not see an ugly soul. He sees a beautiful soul that has been misguided through the delusion of the self. He addresses that person and through that barbaric murderer he brings about an angelic being. How difficult is that task? A person who buries his daughter to bring him to a pedestal where he now sacrifices his life for another. What a grand effort the Blessed Prophet must have put in. Today's religions are so exclusivists are so exclusivist that we say that the other one who is a good human but who does not subscribe to an understanding of God in the way I subscribe to him is going to damnation. Damned is a religious man who in the name of God damns another one. Can you not see this? That religion in itself has become the greatest veil. It's become the greatest point of delusion and the greatest point of damnation. Imagine. The Muslims have the audacity of saying that others are wrong. When the Prophet was asked, what about the others who went before us? The Prophet said, I have no knowledge, it is with God. And Allah says in the Quran, it is all mine, I can forgive whoever I want. But the Muslim takes the ownership from God and says they are all damned in the name of God. It is not only the gender and ethnicity, it is also religion and devotion of God in itself that brings about damnation if the inner being is not right. The same Quran that delivers monstrous people, forges unity with people of other faith, is the Quran that prompts the Muslims to kill Muslims with justification from God. When we become delusional, and we are de deceived, and we become egocentric, then the same word of God yields to us the message of Shaitan and Iblis. 
But if we are fine-tuned from within, then even the demons appear to be lights of God that we can work with. It's a very strange world. Now I want to make one more point, and I do not want to take too long. There are absolute goods at the, at the, life of, at, at the level of morals. They are absolute goods. Saying the truth is absolutely good. Why? Because anything that is productive acquires the value of being called good. Giving life is productive. It promotes greater life, greater existence, so it's good. Saying the truth, being able to trust people, it promotes greater societal harmony and growth. But we find in this world of ours that sometimes lying saves lives. Sometimes saying the truth is counterproductive. Sometimes lying becomes productive and good. I often give this example. So if there's a madman with an axe chasing after me and he asks you, where is Arif? You are supposed to lie. So that my life can be saved. At that point, life, lying is a moral good, is a moral. But why is this the case? Shouldn't truth be the absolute moral of productivity? The reason why this is, is because of the limitations in our worldly existence. Because we are limited, our anger, our insecurity, our anxiety, this prompts us to become wayward. And at that point, in order to tweak it, we need to lie. Giving life is good, but sometimes we have to kill a serial killer. Sometimes we have to kill in order to defend ourselves. Sometimes we have to kill the aggressor on the battlefield. But if humanity were to arrive at a pedestal of godliness, there would be no aggressor. There would remain no greed. There would be no cause to lie. There would be no cause to kill. It shows that the bodily limitations are things that are faltering with everything. And we need to come beyond this. Another point that we need to make is that we become frightened. We are filled with anxiety. And we feel we are frightened. And then we go into superstition. And then we go into whole sort of things. Which then brings a negative color to all the beautiful things that religion has taught us. So now here, as opposed to reaching out to God in confidence, in a state of anxiety and fear, we make a bargain, a bodily bargain with God. God, if you were to do this, I will do this for you in turn. But God smiles. Of course, God doesn't have a face. But the heavens smile. And they say, but what can you give me? You belong to me myself. You yourself belong to me anyway. Can you see that? We begin to bargain with God in a bodily fashion. Allah, if you do this, I'll give sadaqah. You know, I'll give this much money. And there's a smile in the heaven and say, well, what about the bacteria and the microbial creatures? Will you go and sustain them as well with your money? Who's sustaining all of them? Remember the story of Suleiman? He said, allow me to feed on this day on your behalf. He became the great king. Nobody was given such a kingdom. So he said, Allah, allow me to feed it on this day. God said, very well, let it be. A fish comes and opens its mouth. Suleiman, feed me. Suleiman sets his army of man and jinn and whatever else he had. Feed this fish. Night fell upon them. The fish was still hungry. Suleiman prostrated to God and he said, in humility, you are Razak. We bargain with God through fear. But if we could only understand that, wait a minute, the fear is bodily, not me. If death is going to come upon me, no one can save me. Fear of loss. If God has destined loss for me, nobody can secure that particular gain for me. It will be lost. How beautifully Hussein says, Oh Allah, allow me not to plead to you for the delay of a destiny that you have chosen to hasten. Oh Lord, do not allow me to ask you 
for the hastening of a destiny that you have chosen to delay. If you choose to take my Akbar at this moment, allow me to accept it. Rather than pleading with you, it's contrary. Although I'm not saying that it is wrong to plead with God, it is right. But I'm asking us to analyze these things carefully. Through our bodily attributes, we have become falsely identified with the body. And through that identification with the body and its fears and anxieties and its aspirations and its hopes, we are faltering in our relationship with God. Be like the blessed prophet. When he faced the loss, he said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. O oh Allah, it was yours. It has come back to you. When he was faced with an enemy, and armies of enemies, he would say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. When he was faced with an unsurmountable task, he would say, Tawakkal to Allah. He never gave in to the false personality and to the body. He never tried to control and he never struggled in controlling. He let himself free. In order to escape the bondage of ego and become enlightened and move towards God, we need to acknowledge first and foremost, we are not what we assume ourselves to be. And neither is this world what we have taken it to be. It is a mere mirage and I am traveling through it. My sole destination and my goal is my Allah. Now think of these two types of people. Imam Hussein, as I will explain today, comes to Bayda. He says, oh people, you invited me through your countless letters, besieging me to lead you in a revolt. If your intentions and your resolve has not remained, then allow me to leave. Now these are the very people who have called Imam Hussein to lead them in a revolt against Yazid. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad goes, coerces them, imprisons them, kills Muslim, kills Hani. Fear falls upon their souls. And in that fear, they lose a sense of reality. The very people who invite Imam Hussein, who call themselves the Shia of Imam Hussein, have now come in revolt against Imam Hussein. Think about it. Imam Hussein calls them out by name. You wrote to me, you wrote to me, you wrote to me. And they are bowing their heads, but still unprepared to accept that, yes, we did this. Leave aside giving their lives to Imam Hussein. They were so frightened that they dared not even leave the, the army of Umar, uh, Umar ibn Sa'ad. They were that afraid. That is when this body and the bodily and the ego prevails upon us. And there, on the other side, you see Zuhair Qain. What a man. What will you do tomorrow, Zuhair? Imam Hussein asks. I will engage with your enemy with my sword. When my sword breaks, with my lance. When that breaks, I will throw stones at them. When stones finish and my, my, when my arms are cut. And if at that point they were to tear my body into pieces. If after that, Allah restores life in my decapitated body, I shall rush to you once again, O Hussein, to do it all over for you. Where is this and where is that? These are the two parts that we are treading. <laughs> we are in the middle. Enlightenment and becoming spirited people and allowing the emergence of God is to leave behind the body and the bodily and say, you are a burden. Goodbye to you. I'm not saying people die, by the way. I'm saying step away from it within our minds. God is saying, on the day of Qiyamah, la ansaba baynahum. There will be no familial relations between anybody. There's no father, no mother, no brother, no sister finish. It's all gone. It was only you. It was only I. Imam Hussein, 
writes in his letter to the people when he departs from Makkah, let he who wishes to shed his blood for me and me wishes to meet with Allah, leave with me, for indeed I am departing tomorrow. So Imam knew very well that his life will be taken. He prepares his group of people and sets off on route to Kufa. He comes to a place known as Sharaf. At Sharaf, he asks his people to fill the water skins in their containers with water for the onward journey. They are on their onward journey. At a point, somebody cries out, Allahu Akbar. Imam Hussein turns to him and says, Indeed, Allah is great. But what brings takbir to your lips at this point? I see the date palms of Kufa. Somebody who was well acquainted with the route looks on. He said, we are a long way away from Kufa. This is not Kufa. These are not the trees of Kufa. After a pause, he said, this is an army of people drowned in armor. Imam said, camp here. An army approached of thousand men led by a commander by the name of Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. The people from the army said, we were thirsty. Hussein saw our state of thirst. He said to his companion, open the water skins, let them drink. Quench their thirst. And after them, let their animals drink. A man said, I was the last one. Hussein saw my state. He said, kneel your animal. Drink from it and feed your animal. It was time for Dhuhr prayers. Imam came and stood between the two armies. And he said, oh people, I have not come here without your invitation. If you no longer wish me to lead you, let me be and I will return to my home. Everybody fell silent. Imam turned to Hur and he said, Hur, lead your people in prayers. I shall lead mine. Hur said, we will all pray behind you. Hajjaj bin Masru gave the adhan. After the Dhuhr prayers, Imam turned to them. He said, oh people, you have called me to lead you. You know our right. If you still wish for us to lead you and you still acknowledge my right, that we are the worthiest of leaders, then allow me. And if you've turned away from your resolve, then let me be. Who turns to Imam? He said, O oh Hussein, you constantly say that we have invited you. I have no knowledge of this. Imam asked his companion, bring the two sacks of letters that they have written to me. And he displayed the letters and he said, you wrote to me, you wrote to me, you wrote to me. Who said, Hussein, I am not one of those who have invited you. Imam Hussein said, let me be. Who said, no, I have been given strict orders by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad to not part company with you until I deliver you to him in Kufa. Imam Hussein said, death is closer to you, Hur, than you taking me to Kufa. Hur said, O Hussein, I am hopeful that we will find some resolution to this dispute. Allow me to write a letter to Ibn Ziyad and await his instructions. Otherwise, I am unable to let you go. At that point, then Hur looked at Imam Hussein and he said, O Hussein, do not go to war. I have no doubt you will be killed. Imam Hussein looked at Hur and he said, Atukhawwifuni bil maut. Do you frighten me with death, O Hur? Then he recited a poetry. There is no blemish upon a youth who sets out on the path of righteousness and gives his life. If he lives, he lives without blame. If he dies, he dies without regret. It is sufficient for you, O Hur, and the likes of you, that you call yourselves free men and your noses are dragged in dust of humility. Who realizes the resolve of Hussein? As Hussein wants to set off, he grabs the reins of Imam Hussein's steed. 
Imam Hussein turns to him and says, May your mother weep at your death. Who startled? He said, Hussein, had anybody other than you spoken of my mother, I would have responded in a like manner. But I cannot do anything save praise your mother. Imam Hussein set off. Hur goes with him. Whenever Imam Hussein tries to direct himself away, Hur blocks him. There is this impasse between them that continues to a great level until Imam Hussein's steed comes to a point where it refuses to move. Imam Hussein finds this strange. He spurs his steed, but it refuses. Imam calls for another steed and another one. They all refuse to move. Imam Hussein turns to Zuhair bin Qayyim and he said, What is the name of this place? Zuhair says, It is Nainawa. Imam said, Does it have another name? Yes, Shattul Furat. Imam said, Does it have another name? He said, It is known as Karb Bala. Imam descends from his steed. He says, O oh Lord, I seek refuge from you from Karb and Bala. Then he takes hold of his spear, embeds it within the dust by Allah. Here shall our animals stop, our tents shall be pitched, we will be killed, our women will be taken as captives, and our children will be orphaned. Um Kulthum comes to the Imam. She said, Oh brother, what is this place? My heart finds no rest. The Imam says, Oh dear sister, on route back from Sifin, my father and I with our brother rested here. Ali placed his lap, head in the lap of Hassan and he fell asleep. Then he awoke startled. We asked, O oh Father, what be the matter? He said, I saw this very land. It had become a sea of blood. And Hussein was drowning in there. He turned to me, I said, O oh Hussein, what shall you do when this tribulation befalls you? I said, O oh Father, I will persevere for the sake of Allah. Allah la'anatullah al-qawmi al وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون إلهي إن نسلك بحق الحسين وجده وابي وأمه وأخي وتسعة المعصومين من ذريته وبني اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم عجل فرج إمامنا المنتظر واجعل من أنصاره وعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة Hussein al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussein Hussein al-Shaheed al-Shaheed al-Hussein Hussein al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussein Hussein al-Shaheed al-Shaheed al-Hussein you are the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad Mustafa, the son of Imam Ali and Lady Fatima, the purest of souls with utmost purity. Yet thousands of so-called Muslims showed no loyalty they knew you entered the holy cloak by the will of allah yet shroudless they left you on the plains of karbala hussein al gharib al gharib al hussein hussein al shaheed a Shaheed al Hussein. 
حسین غریب غریب حسین حسین شہید شہید حسین یو آر دی ٹیچر آف سیکریفائس اینڈ آف چیریٹی یو ایون فیڈ دی ہورسیز آف your enemies from darkness into light you set who were free for surely he entered heaven with your mother's handkerchief but when you pleaded for mighty oscar who was just thirsty an arrow is what they fed to your infant baby Hussain al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussain Hussain al-Shaheed al-Shaheed al-Hussain Hussain al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussain Hussain al-Shaheed al-Shaheed al-Hussain You are the lantern of guidance for all the world to see. The ark of salvation for all of humanity. Those who fought you in your light called out your name. In your arms you carried them back till only you remained. Sakina, your daughter, went from crying in your arms to seeing your head on a spear in the court of Sham. Hussain al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussain Hussain al-Shaheed al-Shaheed al-Hussain Hussain al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussain Hussain al-Shaheed al-Shaheed al-Hussain You are the root of the branch that Sri Zainul Abedin, a branch that weakened with what his eyes had seen. He endured the scene of Karbala and held his belief, added to his own suffering. No sign of his relief. The sight of women and children tied in chains. And hearing Zainab cry in pain, Where are you, O oh Hussein? Hussein al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussein Hussein al-Shaheed Al-Shaheed al-Hussain Hussain al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussain Hussain al-Shaheed al-Shaheed al-Hussain No Qasim, no Aoun, no Muhammad, no Abbas No Asghar, no Akbar You lost them all so fast. Oh Allah, please accept this humble sacrifice. These were the words of our Imam when Asr time arrived. Oh Allah, what has he lost? He who loses you. But oh Allah, what can he lose? He who finds you Hussain al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussain Hussain al-Shaheed al-Shaheed al-Hussain Hussain al-Gharib al-Gharib al-Hussain Hussain al-Shaheed 
Ashahid al Hussein. You are the Savior of Islam and our faith you did revive. Today we call Ya Mahdi, without him we are deprived. For surely he grieves over tortured beloved. And when we lament the trials faced by Umul al-Masaib, Ya Mahdi, tonight we vow and we grieve with you in the light of al Hussein, together we'll fight for truth Hussein al gharib al gharib al Hussein Hussein a shaheed a shaheed al Hussein Hussein al gharib al gharib al Hussein Hussein a shaheed a shaheed al Hussein Hussein a shaheed a shaheed al Hussein Allah, <laughs> यहाँ संभल कर कदम उठाना ये कर बना है ये कर बना है ये बात है गिज़े ना भूल जाना ये कर बना है ये कर बना है ये कर बना है ये कर बना है जहाँ ने सब रो रजा यही है खुदा ये सब रो रजा यही है यहाँ पे आके है चल के मेहदी बेहिस्ते जहराए सरजमी है यहाँ है जहरा का आना जाना ये कर बना है ये कर बना है ये कर बना है ये कर बना है यहाँ पे हुर भी था हुर वाला भी किताबे हस्ती को पर के देखो सदाए हल मिन जो आ रही है तुम इस तरफ हो या उस तरफ हो तुम्हें अमल से हे अब बताना ये कर बना है ये कर बना है ये कर बना है ये कर बना है कहीं पे कासिम हुए हैं टोकरे कहीं पे जी से गिरे थे माला कहीं सकीना सुमो से लिपटी कहीं पे उस घर ने तीर खाया यही गरीबी का है ठिकाना ये कर बना ये कर बना है ये कर बना है ये कर बना है 
यहाँ संभल कर कदम उठाना ये कर बला है ये कर बला है किसी के दिल में लगी है बर्ची किसी के बाजू कटे यही पर हरियाली की बेटी के कितने यूसुफ लहू में डूबे हैं इस जमी पर लूटा है सादा का घराना ये कर बला ये कर बला है ये कर बला है ये कर बला है रहे कहीं भी जहा में जाकर हुसैन वाले ये जानता है हम हेरे मातम के दिल तक यहाँ की मिट्टी से ही बना है यहाँ है वापस पलट के आना यहाँ पे वाप यहाँ है वापस पलट के आना ये कर बना है ये कर बला है ये कर बला है ये कर बला है यहाँ संभल कर कदम उठाना ये कर बला है ये कर बला है ये कर बला है ये कर बला है We'll now start the Q&A, if we can welcome Sheikh with a salawat. Is this okay? Yeah. Is our fate determined? If not, does God know what will happen? And if he doesn't, how can he be all-knowing? Yes, yeah, So the question is, does God know everything that is going to happen, in our, or does he not? If we say he is all-knowing and he knows what will happen to us, then that is predestination and we can't defy his knowledge. If we say he doesn't, then that falters with God being all-knowing. One of the ways to think about this, although there are several ways to think about this, is for us to understand that the way in which we think about time frame is not accurate. There is no such thing as past and there is no such thing as future. We are always in the absolute now. 
And this now is a point that constantly is progressing. Past is a recollection of the now that has gone, and future is an anticipation of a now that will come. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being all beyond time and embracing time is in the absolute now. So Allah makes his decision now and I make my decision now. It's one and the same thing. It's happening and it's synchronized. It's happening and it is synchronized in one way. So Allah knows and I am committing myself at the same time. Now, the wonderful way in which we understand Allah in the Quran is at one level he is all knowing of everything. And that's why he speaks with Isa on the day of Qiyamah in the revelation. Qiyamah hasn't come. If you could see them on the day of Qiyamah, how they will stand with their heads lowered in front of God. So the future event is being spoken of now. Because in God's now, everything is there. It's already happened. On the other hand, it is animated in now as well. And these both exist simultaneously. But there is changeable destiny and fixed destiny. Both these things are accurate. The Prophet said, nothing changes destiny other than prayers. If destiny was fixed, it would not be changed. So it's in the making. That is another way of understanding it. At the quantum level, nothing is fixed. Anything can fluctuate. The fact that miracles happen and they defy the laws of nature that we appropriate to nature shows that the system is well beyond. So now, the way to understand this is that the Quran says, do you, God has yet to know who is a believer amongst you and who will struggle, as opposed to that, or as opposed to one who is not. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran is saying God has yet to know, as if God doesn't know. But that's no problem because this unique point of freedom that I am, that is undetermined, that is the unique point of freedom of the Divine Himself. He can change his mind at any point he wants. In that way, nothing is fixed. And for him, in the absolute now, to know everything and to change the course of everything, for me, that doesn't pose any problem. Yeah? So the destiny is determined and undetermined. God knows everything in the now, and that's the absolute knowledge in the now. I hope that answer makes sense, though. You've mentioned that the soul challenged God to be on this earth. Can you tell us more about the souls before they came to this earth? So, challenged, no, but we bore the responsibility of coming here ourselves. Now, the Quran says, we indeed offered our trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains. They all trembled in awe and they refused. Human bore this trust. Indeed, he is oppressive and he is quite ignorant. So now it seems that at that point there was no stopping us. So even as a parental figure, we could not, uh, who, God is a parental figure, he would try to stop us, we would not stop. We would say, no, we want this and we are going to do it. So the Quran says that this is what happened prior to our existence and our creation. Although the Quran doesn't say prior to, but that's what we deduce. So that is what happened before we came here. Now, the traditional theological view does not make sense at all. That we were not. We were initiated through Adam. And then we, were sent, we have been sent on this earth. Here, this particular version will make God quite ruthless and callous and careless. Why did you send us here when you knew that we are so weak? I mean, even if there was a paradise for offer, but is it worth all this bloodshed and 8 billion people suffering in the way that they are? It's not really worth it. So you are a very reckless God, we would have said to him. So the only way, I mean, reason says that no, he cannot be so reckless and he can't do this. And the other argument is that Allah expects us to thank him for the life of this earth. You can't thank him unless we have asked him for it and it's a favor of his. If it is a favor that is imposed upon us, then it's not a favor. It's like us going and giving somebody something that they haven't asked for and then expect them to thank us for it. It's quite a nuisance actually. I would rather not receive this in order to thank you. You get that? 
So in that case then, as the Quran says, our trust was offered to the heavens and the earth and the mountains. They refused, but human beings bore it. It wasn't even offered to them. Yeah? As per the description that one might have had with God about this world being cumbersome, what to do if you don't feel this life is a blessing from Allah? Then in that case, we need to look into our souls and very authentically approach God and say to Him, I am struggling. I do not see this world as a blessing. But internally, when I turn inwards and I ask myself what a God should be like, I find a beautiful, perfect picture of God who is loving, who is kind, who is gentle, who is parental. After I know this at the depth of my heart, I know that there is something that I am not understanding. I leave myself in your hands and I hand myself over to you and help me through this struggle and resolve this problem for me. Because such problems cannot be resolved by reasoning. Because mind only takes us to a certain point. It can only be resolved when God touches the heart with his blessed hand and contents us there. If we have senses that are related to the body, sight, sound, etc., do we know anything about the different senses we will have in the next life? If people were to practice solitude, meditation, and dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, absolutely they get glimpses of that state of existence. The sharpness, the vividity, how things are hypened, the perception is hypened. Definitely we do get a glimpse of it. If people can go into meditation and pacify their soul, arrest the constant thought process and bring to rest the emotions that are constantly involved within the heart, yes, then they can get a glimpse. Given that the social constructs needs to be shed and it is manageable to attempt to overcome oneself, how would you interpret react to being discriminated against? One of the things I forgot to mention, if I'm, I, I didn't hear you properly, but if... Should, should I say again? Yes, please. Given that social construct, constructs need to be shed and it is manageable to attempt to overcome oneself, how would you interpret or react to being discriminated against by yeah. somebody? Yes, of course, of course. I forgot to mention one thing in the lecture, that it is the bodily aspect of ours that then gives way to discrimination and discriminatory attitudes. That I am better than you and you didn't fail to mention that now. If we are discriminated against, of course we feel offended, don't we? But we need to look beyond that initial offense. And we need to understand that this is a human community and a human family. And discrimination that is directed to me, in some way I am discriminating against others as well. So as a minority, I am discriminated against. As a minority, I also discriminate against others. After the initial offense to realize that we as a human family, we have yet to mature come of age and remove all forms of discrimination but not live in an idealistic world that we'll be able to do it we have to make little attempts at saying well I can't feel offended that person after all is involved in a state that he can be forgiven or she can be forgiven because they know no better but at the same time I may be doing the same thing to another person as well and I need to check my own self and then to engage with actually people of other faiths, other ethnicities, other nationalities in a human way. The best way to address discrimination is to establish human contact so that people can see actually beyond the color is a human, beyond status is a human, beyond gender is a human. And that's the best way to take away discrimination. The other thing is to understand their point of view and where they are coming from and then to address the issue in that manner. You know, we often get offended at people who are monstrous and we want their destruction. What we fail to understand is, well, 
Why are they in this way? How have they understood life that has made them what they have become? That would be a better approach like the Prophet did. He understood what was causing this monstrosity in his people and he addressed it at that point to get a better understanding. And sorry, just very briefly as we're nearly out of time, should there be no absolutism within religion, religious guidelines or rules? As you said, in some situations, lying may be a moral good. Would this apply to all morals? And should we take a situationistic approach to religion? There, are absolute, there is one absolute property in this realm of our existence, and that is self-liberation. Everything is liberating itself and actualizing its own potential. So the absolute is a negational self-liberation. However, as far as moral values are concerned, you will not find any absolutely applicable. If you're talking about growth property, that's an absolute one. But sometimes saying the truth yields growth. Sometimes withholding the truth yields growth. Majority of the time giving life brings growth. At, on occasions taking life gives growth. In that way, there are no absolutes, not because giving life is not an absolute in and of itself or saying the truth, but because of the limitations of the worldly, material, bodily context in which we are. So there are no absolute application of the absolute moral values. Yes, definitely. I would agree with that. Unfortunately, we are out of time. If your question did not get asked, inshallah, it will be asked tomorrow. Refreshments will be at the back of the hall. 